Hi Year 5, I'm going to carry on reading Journey to the River Sea from the chapter that we finished off back in school. So this is chapter 4. Mrs Carter was delighted to hear that Maya could not keep up with the twins. The first real smile they had seen on her lit up her flabby face and she gave permission readily enough for Maya to work on her own. Of course Beatrice and Gwendolyn are intelligent, I've always known that. She gave Maya quite a kind look. I dare say you'll catch up soon enough if you apply yourself. So each morning Maya was set to work on the veranda at a small wicker table. Miss Minton gave her exercises and projects and occasionally she left Dr Borman and the twins to see if she needed help. But mostly Maya worked on her own and she loved it. She learned about the explorers who had braved incredible hardship to map the rivers and mountains of Brazil and the great trees which supplied the world with precious woods and rare medicines. And it was as though Miss Minton's book had gave, given her back the mysterious country she so longed to see and which the Carters had shut out. She was told to write stories about whatever interested her. She learnt poetry by heart and she wrote it. From time to time she would knock on the door of the dining room where the twins were doing their lessons and ask how to spell a word, choosing an easy one so the girls would despise her. How do you spell table? Maya would say, trying to sound worried. And Beatrice would tell her how to spell it and say, goodness, can't you even spell that? But mostly, no one took any notice of what Maya was doing. The teaching had been good at the academy, but Miss Minton was a born teacher. Not that Maya enjoyed all of her lessons. Minty insisted on an hour of maths each day, and she also made her go on learning Portuguese. And Maya was about to complain when she tried out a few words on the sullen maid, Tappy, and found that Tappy had understood her and almost smiled. I'm going to pause there and I want you to have a little think about this question. I'm going to carry on. So it was because Miss Minton was determined that she should learn about the country she lived in that Maya had had her first meeting with Mr Carter in his study. The girls were drawing a teapot, according to the instructions of Dr Borman, narrowing their round blue eyes as they measured the exact distance from the handle to the spout. When Miss Minton came to Maya and said, it's time you learn how to draw proper maps, go and ask Mr Carter there's a chart or a map of the country surrounding his house. Maya looked up, alarmed. She had barely spoken to Mr Carter, who mostly sat silent and gloomy at meals and vanished as soon as he could. Must I? asked Maya. Yes, said Miss Minton, and returned to the twins. Mr Carter's room was the end one in the main part of the house. As Maya knocked on the door, she heard a shuffling and a rustling, as though papers were being quickly put away. Then he called, come in. The room was dismal and dark, like all the rooms in the house, and the air was full of smoke from the cigarettes which hung from Mr Carter's lower lip whenever he was alone. It was also dusty because he did not allow the maids to come in and clean. The charts and sales figures tacked to the wall had curl curling edges and looked as though they'd been there for years. Piles of paper lay in untidy heaps on the drawers and filing cabinets. But in the centre of Mr Carter's desk was a cleared space covered in a white cloth and on it were small round objects which he was examining carefully through a lens. At first, Maya thought they might be samples of rubber or specimens of soil or seeds. But when she came closer, she gave a little gasp. They were eyes. Glass eyes, but definitely eyes and not the eyes of dolls or teddy bears. No, these were human eyes. They were so carefully made that it was hard to believe they were not real. The back of the eyes were hollowed like seashells to fit over the muscles of the person who had worn them. 
but the front was a perfectly copied ball. There were blue eyes and brown eyes and hazel eyes, and in the centre of the coloured part, a black pupil which looked as though it really must let in the light. As you can see, I'm sorting my collection, said Mr Carter. He picked up one of the largest of the balls, crisscrossed with tiny scarlet veins, and held it to the light. This is the left eye of Duke of Wainford. He lost the real one in the Battle of Waterloo. It's worth a pretty penny, I can tell you. Maya swallowed. How do you get a hold of them? Oh, I have a man who sends them from England. There's quite a few dealers in the business. They get them from the undertakers as often as not. Most people don't mind too much what happens afterwards. He put down the Duke's eye and picked up another one. Now this one's really special. It's the right eye of a famous actress who was burnt in a fire in the theatre. Tilly Tyndall, she was called. Look at the colour. It's as blue as the sky, isn't it? You wouldn't believe what that would fetch. Of course, the really valuable ones are the doubles, but they're rare. You mean two eyes from the same person? From someone who's lost both eyes? Mr Carter nodded. I've got three sets and they're worth more than the rest put together. He put out a hand towards a velvet blue box and then changed his mind. The doubles were too valuable to show a child. I tell you, said Mr Carter, if this house went up in flames, it's my collection I'd save. After you'd saved your wife and the twins, Maya said. He looked up sharply. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, that goes without saying. Now, what was it that you'd wanted? I've got another question for you to think about. Miss Linton wondered whether you might have a map or a chart of the country round the house. It's just to borrow for a little while. Mr Carter sighed, but he got up and began to rummage in a number of drawers. Here you are, he said, returning with a rolled up chart. It covers ten square miles behind the house. Make sure you bring it back. Maya thanked him and left. She'd never seen such a sad room or a sad hobby. But the map was interesting. She took it to her room and waited till evening when Miss Minton came to do what she called hearing Maya read. Since Maya had read fluently since she was six years old, this mostly meant asking Maya what she thought of David Copperfield or arguing about sentimental poems which Maya liked and Miss Minton didn't. Look, I've been trying to copy this but it's difficult. Would you believe there are so many little rivers and streams and channels behind the house? It looks as though one could go to Manus the back way, not down the main river, if one had a canoe. And if one knew the way, said Miss Minton, looking at the maze of little waterways. There's another question for you to think about. After she left, Maya again climbed onto the chair and looked out to the huts at the back. She'd found out how to loosen the netting nailed over the window so she could undo the catch. She knew the lullaby now that came from the middle hut where Tappy and Furo lived. Sometimes she hummed it to herself in bed and she was beginning to make out more and more people. The girl who had walked across the first night in the bright dress was called Conchita. Her baby was a demon, always trying to wriggle out of her gaff grasp and the old lady in the middle hut who tended to the chickens was Furo's aunt. But blow the wind southerly, the tune she had heard someone whistle on the first night never came again. That Maya's lessons were so interesting was a good thing because the twins went on being unfriendly and rude. Each day when she saw them in the fresh white dresses which Taffy's young sister washed and ironed in the small steamy hut behind the boathouse she felt hopeful. 
The fair girls, their pretty dresses, their pink and blue ribbons seemed to belong to the twins she had imagined before she came. But the girls lived strange lives inside the stuffy house, like those pale insect grubs that exist only to be fed and groomed by others. The twins ordered the servants to comb their hair, pick up their handkerchiefs, iron their hair ribbons, and they never went anywhere alone, following each other even to the bathroom. And when they shook their heads or nodded, they moved absolutely together as though they were puppets pulled by the same string. Yet one did not get the feeling that they were particularly fond of each other, or indeed of anyone or anything else. As for Maya, the girls never lost a chance of snubbing her or making her feel unwanted. Mostly it was just words, but sometimes when there was no one there, they pushed her against the wall of the corridor or dug their elbows into her. It was a long time since Maya had thought Gwendolyn's pinch that first day had been an accident. Why do they hate me, Minty? she asked, bewildered. What have I done to them? In all ways, Miss Linton just answered, they must not be used to you yet. Just give them time. And there's a question for you to think about. Then, at the beginning of the following week, they went to Nana's. Perhaps Maya may prefer to just stay behind and rest, suggested Mrs Carter hopefully. Oh no, please! Mr Murray has made it clear that Maya is to have dancing lessons and music lessons also, said Miss Minton firmly. Since the twins' lessons were being paid for by the money Maya had bought, there was nothing Mrs Carter could do. They travelled down the Negro in the same dark launch as had brought them from the ship. Mrs Carter and the twins sat in the cabin with the doors and windows shut and Maya and Miss Minton sat on the deck. Your hair will get all messy out there, said Beatrice. But Maya needed to feel the wind on her face. She felt as if she'd been in prison for a week. Though they had docked there, Maya had not really seen the city. Now, as they drove from the harbour in a cab drawn by an old horse in a sun hat, she was amazed by the beauty and elegance of Manus. They drove past mansions painted in every colour, pink and blue, with flowers tumbling from window boxes. In the gardens surrounding them were blossoming orange and lemon trees, and mangoes and wonderful creepers climbing over the railings. They passed two churches, a museum, a little park with a bandstand, and a children's playground. Everywhere were busy people, black women carrying baskets on their heads, Indian women with babies on their hips, messenger boys smartly dressed, Europeans and nuns ferrying lines of little children. And on the far side of the huge square, paved in swirling mosaics, stood a magnificent building, roofed in tiles of green and gold, with the eagle of Brazil in precious stones soaring over the top. Oh look, said Maya, the theatre, isn't it beautiful? That's where Clovis is going to act, the boy we met on the boat. We're going there later to pick up our tickets said Beatrice. We're going to see little Lord Fauntroy, said Gwendolyn. Oh, good, said Maya innocently. That's the play he's got the lead in. The twins looked at each other, but they said nothing then. They drove down an elegant a street of elegant shops, dress shops and shoe shops, saddlers and hat makers. It was incredible. This luxury a thousand miles from the mouth of the river. There seemed to be everything here that one could find in Europe. The dress shops excited the twins and they leant out of the cab, peering and arguing. There's another question to think about. Florette's still got that polka dot muslin in the corner. Can we go in, Mummy? You said we could shop properly this month. Can we have new dresses? Mrs Carter nodded. She would be able to pay off the money she owed to Florette. Well, not all of it, 
She owed money everywhere, and Maya's allowance would have to be doled out carefully. Fortunately, Maya herself wouldn't need new clothes for a long time. The child was dressed very plainly, she thought, looking at Maya's blue poplin skirt and white blouse. But the materials were good. At first, they stopped at Madame de Champ's Academy of Dance. Madame de Champ was a French woman who had the wit to understand that the wealthy rubber growers, growers and the merchants who had come to Manus wanted to make sure that their children missed nothing they could have had in Europe. So she ran classes in ballroom dancing, folk dancing, ballet. The class the twins went to was a mixed one for both girls and boys. There were children of all nationalities, Russian, English, French, and of course, Brazilian. Some pure Portuguese, some of mixed race, Indian with Portuguese, black with Indian. For the people of Brazil had intermarried for centuries and were proud of their mixed blood. Maya changed quickly into her dancing shoes and turned round to see the twins sitting side by side on a locker, their plump legs sitting out in front of them, waiting for Miss Minton to come and help. Miss Porterhouse always put on our shoes and tied up our hair, said Beatrice. So did Miss Chisholm, said Gwendolyn. Maya went ahead into the big room with its tall windows. It was full of chattering, swirling children waiting for Madame Duchamp. An old lady with mottled hands sat at the piano, absently touching the keys. A tall Russian boy with red hair came over and introduced himself. I'm Sergei, he said with a friendly smile, and this is my sister Olga. Maya put out her hand. I'm Maya. I'm staying with the Carters. Yes, we heard. A sunny looking Austrian girl with plaits around her head came to join them. This was Netta Holtman, the daughter of the twins' piano teacher. Maya was usually shy with new people, but the relief of seeing all these ordinary, welcoming children was overwhelming, and she was soon chattering in the same mixture of languages that the other children used. She had not realised that every word she spoke to the twins had to be thought about and weighed. I'm going to stop there. If you have a little look at the bottom of this video, I'm going to put some more questions for you to answer and a big idea question for you to think about. Bye.